Good morning. Our children who go to uh, Sunday school are dismissed. Today I want to study one of the hardest chapters in the Bible, Revelation chapter 16. It's hard not because it's so difficult to understand, but because it's tough for us sinners, even us Christians, to face how our holy God must judge sin. And yet this chapter is very necessary as part of the book of Revelation and part of the Bible. So I want to begin again by uh, praying, even though we just prayed, and get straight into our study this morning. And since Brother Oren didn't have you stand for the final song, I'd like to ask all of you to stand in respect for the Lord as we talk to Him one last time and commit the message to Him. Father, I thank You uh, so much this morning for the rain. Your Word tells us that You send the rain on the just and on the unjust. And Father, this is a, just an uh, indication of the great, merciful God that you are, that you give us many things that we don't deserve. And we want to praise you most of all this morning for who you are, for what you are. And Father, if we lost everything else in life, we would still have you, which means we would have lost nothing. And so Father, I pray this morning as we go look into your word that the spirit of the living God that we have just sung about would be our teacher, that you would give us uh, insight into this very tough chapter, but it's a true chapter, and so we need it, and so we pray for your help as we study together. Ask this in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I want to begin by reviewing where we've come so far in Revelation and to preview this chapter Uh, chapter 16. So I want to show you a chart, and I want to begin by let's looking back to the book of Exodus at the 10 plagues that God sent on Egypt because there are so many parallels between these 10 plagues and the three series of judgments that we have studied and that we will study today. So you remember in Exodus, the 10 plagues God sent on Egypt. First, the Nile and the fresh water became blood. Then God sent frogs, Now, the third plague, we're not exactly sure what type of insect. One of the things that as you study the Bible that you will learn, the flora and fauna of the Bible, that is the plants and animals, the rocks and minerals, because it took place so long ago, we're not positively sure every single time what they were. In this case, gnats doesn't sound so bad, but they could have been lice, like the King James tradition. They could have been fleas, ticks, or mosquitoes. So... Uh, Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse with these uh, insects that draw blood like fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes, you've got flies. And flies are much, much worse because they're so filthy and the horrible sound. (laughs) Then the livestock die. Then there are boils in people's skin. Then there's hail, locusts. There's darkness. And then finally, the firstborn of Egypt die. Then let's look at how the first set of judgments called the seal judgments parallel those in the next chart. So remember in Revelation 6, we studied the first seal. I believe the four horsemen are angels. Uh, So the first angelic horseman on a white horse uh, basically uh, provides the circumstances for Antichrist to rise to power. Then the second seal, the second horseman on a red horse brought war. Or will bring war. The third angelic horseman on a black horse causes famine. Fourth angelic horseman on a pale green horse is death, followed by Hades, and a quarter of the human race dies. Let's move forward. Then the fifth seal, martyrs in heaven pray for vengeance on their murderers, a very different picture of heaven than what we consider, but it's in God's word. Then the sixth seal, disasters in space, in the atmosphere, and a violent earthquake, the worst up until that point in history. Then finally, the seventh seal produces the seven trumpets. Now let's move forward to those trumpet judgments. And again, keep in mind the comparisons to the plagues as we look. Hail and fire fall on the first trumpet, a third of the vegetation of earth burned up. Then the second trumpet, a third of the seas become blood, a third of the sea life dies, a third of the ships destroyed. Third trumpet, a third of the fresh waters turn bitter, because of some object that falls into the waters, and many people die as a result of drinking it. Again, uh, the fourth trumpet, a third of the sun, moon, and stars are darkened, which results in a third darkness in the day and night, either 
that the candle power dims by a third or there's a period of, of a third of the night, a third of the day are actually dark. Move forward. The fifth trumpet, locust-like demons, and notice again the parallel here, with scorpion stings and their tails torment people for five months, which shows you how long the trumpet judgments take place. Then the sixth trumpet, a third of the human race dies from four angels who are released, which bring on 200 million troops and their horses. And then finally, the seventh trumpet will then result in the seven bowls we studied today. And I'll give you a preview of the bowls here. Let's look at those. The seven bowls today we'll look at. First bowl, painful sores. Think of the boils from Egypt. All the seas become blood. All the sea life dies in the second bowl. Third bowl, all the rivers and fresh waters become blood. Fourth bowl, the sun burns people. Move forward. Uh, the painful darkness in the fifth bowl. The sixth bowl, Euphrates River dries up. Armies and the kings of the east invade. There's three frog-like demons. Uh, that deceive the nations into coming. We'll look at that. And then the mega quake, the mega earthquake, terrestrial disasters, and 100-pound hailstones. So this is a scary chapter. I'd like to, let's move forward one more. Um, and so comparing then the Trump, the plagues with just the bowls, I've shown you the comparisons here between the plagues and the bowls. So let me make three observations. First, God is consistent in all of his ways. If God judged Egypt with 10 literal plagues, then I think we are on solid ground as we look at these bowls and the other judgments to interpret them literally. But of course, a literal event can also have a symbolic significance, and I think it's the symbols that then teach us valuable lessons, and we'll look at some of those. Second, if you examine closely the details, especially the trumpets, you notice one-third, one-third, one-third of all the things were struck in the trumpets, but in the bowls, everything on earth is struck uh, by those. So they are different. The trumpets are different from the bowls. And finally, if you compare the, the seals, trumpets, and bowl judgments, they take place in sequence. There's 21 of them, and they, they go uh, throughout that tribulation period that will be in the future of seven years and they become progressively worse. So that as we look at these bowls today, they get worse, and the worst of all is the seventh, this mega quake. So now let's study chapter 16 of Revelation, beginning in verse 1. John the Apostle says, Then I heard a loud voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, we saw how these seven angels come out with seven bowls in their hands, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath, on the earth. Now this voice is probably God the Father's voice, and notice that the word loud is the Greek word megos, from which we get our prefix mega that gets attached to so many words in English. I just used one, mega quake or mega earthquake. This word megos is the key word in chapter 16. We read it 11 times, but it gets translated different ways, and so I will show you as we go through the text, it's sometimes translated, or twice it's translated loud, a couple of times or several times as great, but it also is translated severe, enormous. And so English is such a rich language that we can translate words many, many more ways than, say, uh, Greek could. But I'll indicate those as we go along in the text. Years ago, the famous Bible teacher J. Vernon McGee, who is still with us on radio, even though he's dead, he still speaks, uh, almost, after almost half a century of insipid preaching, not talking about my preaching, of course, from America's pulpits, the average man believes that God is all sweetness and light and would not discipline or punish anyone. Well, <laughs> J. Vernon McGee says, this book of Revelation tells a different story, and he's so right. Today, it is still not politically correct to talk about God's wrath that we've just talked about, so... Just for a minute, I'm going to be not PC, and I want us to just uh, think about God's wrath. So think with me here. We all get angry when we see wrongs and injustices, and that's because every human being is created in God's image. And so we all get angry when we see something that is wrong. We all hate evil, and even the rankest unbeliever, if you push them far enough, 
they get mad when a wrong is done to them or their family or their group. But the more we believers are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the more we should hate evil. The more our worldview, our morals, our conscience are conformed to God's word, the more we should feel outraged by injustice. So when we think of God, God is perfect So he is able to feel perfect anger, perfect rage, perfect wrath towards sin. But God's holiness also means that he must right the wrongs in the world. He must judge sin. He must punish evil. So the next time time someone challenges you and says, why does God allow all the evil in the world? One thing you can say is, well, at our church we've been studying the book of Revelation. And Revelation tells us that one day soon, God will do something about all those evils in the world. You see, when we read in the newspaper or on the internet some terrible thing that's happened, what do we do? We just shake our heads, roll our eyes, cluck our tongues, and gripe. God someday is going to actually do something about all these terrible things like child predators, murderers, rapists, rogue dictators, terrorists even idiot politicians. And before I go on to back to the text, as we're still thinking about the subject of God's wrath, I have to mention the gospel because this is an area so many people do not understand how God's wrath fits in the gospel. God's wrath is not just something he's going to pour out someday during the tribulation or in hell. Right now at this very minute, God's wrath is on every unbeliever. Let's look at this famous verse at the end of John chapter 3. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. If you have believed in Jesus, the Son of God, you have eternal life. Period. That is God's promise. But notice the rest of the verse. But the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life, Instead, the wrath of God remains or abides on him right now. So it's not that the wrath of God will someday fall on people when they go to hell. That's true. But it's on them right now. When God saves and forgives us sinners, he's not being lenient. He's not letting us off the hook. Get this conception of God out of your minds that God is some kindly old gentleman in the sky like a finger-looking good Colonel Sanders up in heaven who says, okay, boys will be boys. No, the only way that God can save and forgive us is because his son, Jesus Christ, bore the full penalty of God's wrath in our place on the cross. That is why we're saved, because Jesus took the wrath of God in our place. So let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that tells us that. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than since we have now been declared righteous or justified by his blood, we will be saved through him from what? From wrath. If you think God is harsh to pour out his wrath in these tribulation judgments we're about to study, remember this. God first poured out his wrath on his own son on the cross to save us. And when God unleashes his wrath in these bold judgments, it's going to be on people who have rejected his son. They already are under his wrath, and they will receive even more in these bold judgments. So let's read now these very fearful demonstrations of God's anger and rage, beginning in verse 2 of Revelation 16. Yeah, this, it's a misprint, I'm sorry. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and severely painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Now, I believe these are literal sores that will break out on people's skin worldwide. Imagine a worldwide epidemic. Some Bible students think that the, this particular judgment may be the result of weapons of mass destruction, either chemical or biological or nuclear uh, weapons of some kind. 
Who knows? We don't know how God will inflict these, but there's also symbolism going on here. There's also irony going on here. Those who worship the beast in his image, remember what they will do? They will have a mark on their forehead and on their hand. And so what does God do in judgment? He gives them other marks on their skin, these terrible uh, sores. Now, I want to make two medical observations about this first bold judgment. An open sore on someone's skin is a sign of an infection inside. The beast worshipers all have a spiritual heart problem. Instead of worshiping God, they worship the beast and the dragon instead. So the external sores on their skin reveals that they have something wrong internally, a spiritual problem. A second observation I'd make about these sores, constant pain in someone's life changes their disposition. It makes them very difficult to get along with, with other people. So because of these sores, human relations during that tribulation, at least at the end, will be the worst in history. It takes the most remarkable person to suffer intense pain and not lash out at other people. We all, when we feel pain, we feel miserable. So even those that we love and are closest to, we lash out at them. So that shows you the perfection and the majesty of Jesus as he was on the cross. When he was feeling the most intense pain, what did he do? He forgave his enemies. He took care of his mother. He saved the thief who believed in him. He prayed to God. He quoted scripture. This was the reaction of Jesus under the most excruciating pain. So in the tribulation, these sores will make people, we would say, sore or hard to get along with uh, each other in the world. Verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea. It turned to blood like a dead man's, and all life in the sea died. You know, God created the oceans of planet Earth to be this vast reservoir of life, and we're so used to seeing this picture, like from the space shuttles and the uh, space stations of our gorgeous blue planet. Imagine if this changes, flip, to the whole sea becoming either real blood or what looks like uh, blood, some terrible red uh, color. It will be, from space, it might even look more purple because of the mix with the blue. Obviously, colors are a perception of our eyes. But this second bold judgment could be the cumulative result of the pollution from God's previous judgment. It could also be the result of man's own pollution of the oceans over the years, his misuse of God's great uh, gift of natural resources. But regardless, the seas will become a grave of death, instead of a womb of life as God intended. Now, when you think about this, the whole ocean's turning to blood, it seems fantastic, doesn't it? So I really understand our Christian brothers and sisters, our friends, who see this as just symbolic because they say, man, how could that ever happen? And I don't think it's a lack of faith. It is fantastic. But as I look at this and the results of it, um, I think that the symbolic only is harder to believe than say it's literal with symbols uh, along with it. So there are symbols here and irony. And so just think about with me that much of the world's food supply is dependent on the oceans. So when all the fish and the sea creatures die, that food source will get cut off. Think of the world's beaches strewn with the rotting carcasses of sea animals washed ashore. Think of the stench but that is God's poetic justice at work. The Bible tells us that man's sin is an abomination to God. A verse I've shown you before, Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to or in the sight of God, New King James. The word abomination means something hateful, disgusting, revolting, odious. To God, our sin stinks. So in this bold judgment where everything in the sea dies and it causes this horrible smell, God is basically letting, at last, the sin of mankind smell to us like it has always smelled to God. So there's this incredible dual thing going on in this chapter between the literal 
and the symbolic. Verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. I heard the angel of the waters say, addressing God, you are righteous who is and who was the Holy One, for you have decided these things because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets. Lord, you also gave them blood to drink. They deserve it. Then I heard someone from the altar chime in and say, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. That's a quote in the last here from the great hymn that we studied last week. This third bowl judgment strikes the fresh waters of earth. Again, turning it, we're not sure, either into blood or into a red color that looks like blood. And here, the angel who's in charge of the waters explains the symbolism for us. It's not just me connecting the dots for you. The angel does it. Now, this angel seems to be the superintendent of God's water department. So uh, God apparently has delegated to angels responsibilities in his creation. But this particular angel explains that God makes the punishment fit the crime. Earth dwellers, beast worshipers spilled the blood of God's saints and his servants. So now God gives them blood to drink. But that's how God always works. If you look through Scripture, God has always done poetic justice. Let's look at three examples. I've given you another chart. Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites whom God called his firstborn son. So what does God do? God kills Pharaoh's and the Egyptians' firstborn in the 10th plague. Pharaoh drowns the Hebrew baby boys in the Nile, so God drowns Pharaoh's armies in the Red Sea. King Saul refuses to obey God and kill all the Amal Amalekites and their king, so Saul commits suicide and then an Amalek finds his body and lies about killing Saul. One more example, and I love this one. Haman builds the gallows in the book of Esther to hang Mordecai on and plans to exterminate the Jews, so what has happened? Haman is hanged on his own gallows, and his family is exterminated. So what we see in the book of Revelation is just what we've been reading in the Bible all along. And if you live long enough, brothers and sisters, you see what goes around comes around in life. If you, as we sow, we reap. And the wonderful thing is, it's not just about sin. Yes, if we sin, there will be consequences. But every time we obey God, there are also consequences to that. So every time we are obedient, we are sowing seeds of blessing that eventually will catch up with us. So the sowing and reaping is both on the good side and on the bad side. And of course, God's perfect standard in making these judgments is himself because he is completely righteous, just, and holy. Verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. He was given the power to burn people with fire from the sun, and the people were burned by the intense heat of the sun. So what did they do? They blasphemed the name of God who had, give, who had the power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fourth bowl judgment may be caused by man's air pollution over the years, plus God's previous judgments of the seals and trumpets. We're not sure how this will happen. Either Earth's ozone layer will be depleted, which causes the sun's light and heat to be worse, or massive solar flares may erupt into space and scorch the Earth with fire and heat. But the most important thing here is notice the reaction of the Earth dwellers. They don't curse the sun. They curse the God who made the sun and controls it. The beast worship, the beast. Worshippers would not submit to the Son of God, the S-O-N of God. So now God makes them submit to the S-U-N in the sky. Again, there's this poetic justice woven all through this chapter. And I would just say here, as you look at the reaction of these people, when they are punished, they did not repent. Every person here, listen to me. Children, are you listening to me? I know you're tired from all that sugar that's now crashing. Um, when you disobey your parents, confess that, admit that. And parents, grandparents, all of us adults, when we do wrong, we should first confess it and admit it to God and repent and to our spouse or our children or our friends or whoever is involved. We need to keep short accounts. 
Don't be like these people. God has called us as Christians to a different calling. Keep short accounts. The only other place where this word blaspheme is used in the book of Revelation is of the beast himself. And he blasphemes God. Do you see what is happening here? The beast worshipers are now taking on the character of the idol that they worship. They are remade in the image of the God, small g, the God that they serve. They are blaming the God of heaven for their suffering rather than taking the responsibility for their own sinfulness, which is true repentance. Obviously, playing the blame game, playing the victim will reach all-time highs in the tribulation. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and, the kingdom was, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues because of their pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and the, their sores, yet they did not repent of their actions. God now plunges his divine dagger into the heart of the beast's throne and Satan's kingdom on earth. A catastrophic, preternatural darkness engulfs the third planet from the sun. One piece of evidence that these bold judgments occur in rapid succession is that when this shroud of darkness envelops the earth, people are still suffering from the sores in the first bowl. And again, instead of crying out to God for mercy, the natural reaction, these people's hearts are so hard that they refuse to repent. This is the most vivid picture in the Bible of what hell will be like forever for those who persist in rebellion against God. That is why, brothers and sisters, it is so important for us to not be like these people, that we are quick to admit, quick to confess, quick to repent. But there's irony here once again. How did the devil begin his career? He was Lucifer, the shining morning star. Paul tells us that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. Now Satan's kingdom is shown for what it really is, a domain of darkness. Colossians 1.13. God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the Son he loves. How did Jesus rescue us from this dark domain? Never forget it, because Jesus suffered what we would suffer forever in hell, in the blackness of separation from God, as he hung on the cross those last three hours from noon until 3 p.m. in total darkness. How can we ever doubt that he loves us after all he has been through for us? The sixth bowl, is a judgment that prepares mankind for what may be World War III. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Then I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the dragon's mouth, from the beast's mouth, and from the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs who travel to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle of the great day of God, the Almighty. The Euphrates River is 1,700 miles long, 1,700 miles long. It's in modern Iraq mainly, but it also goes into Syria. It was the eastern boundary of Israel at their height in the Old Testament, the river Euphrates was the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire in the New Testament, and it may be the eastern boundary of the beast's revived Roman Empire in the tribulation. This sixth bowl dries up the Euphrates waters to make a dry road for the armies of these kings of the east to cross. And, of course, these kings of the East could easily be from modern India, China, and other Asian nations leading, easily leading a 200 million man army, which we saw and studied about in Revelation 9. Again, I take this as a literal prophecy because how did Israel cross the Red Sea on dry ground? How did they cross the Jordan on dry ground? So just like God parted the Red Seas, parted the Jordan, I see that this is also a literal dry ground for these armies to cross in the tribulation. Now, let's look at a couple of maps. <clears throat> Here we see in this 
big red line from the Persian Gulf all the way north from Syria, actually into Turkey, is the Euphrates River. Israel is this tiny, tiny country here on the uh, edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, look at the big players around here, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, of course, Russia to the north, China over here, India over here. So this is the Euphrates. Go, go ahead. This is a Google map of the Middle East. And again, here is the Euphrates River coming from the Persian Gulf up through Syria to Turkey, Israel again over here. Notice, if you're bringing armies from India and Southeast Asia, you have to cross south of the Himalayas, which is here. And if you're from China with a lot of armies, you're going to come from the north route. You're going to meet in Afghanistan, Pakistan, cross Iran. The only barrier to Israel is the Euphrates River. So if you're a military strategist, literally God is going to pave the way for these armies to come and attack Israel, which of course is going to result in Jesus returning at his second coming to rescue Israel. So this is all, this is the only land bridge coming across to Israel through this part of Asia, and the Euphrates is the only barrier that they would have to take. And that one more picture is what the Euphrates looks like when it's at <coughs> flood stage. Now, these Asian kings and their armies, as well as the armies of the kings of all the nations, are gathered by these three unclean spirits or demons. And these demonic messengers are gathered uh, by the anti-trinity that we've looked at in chapter 13, you remember. Uh, Satan the dragon imitating God the Father, Antichrist or the first beast imitating Jesus, and the second beast or false prophet imitating the Holy Spirit. The reference to the mouths of this unholy trinity may indicate that these demons are telling lies, what we would call propaganda, to deceive these kings of the nations into sending their armies. Who knows what kind of stories will be told to get them to mass these armies and send them into Israel. You recall the Old Testament story of King Ahab? The very same thing happened. God allowed a lying demon or spirit to go and trick Ahab into going into a disastrous battle where he lost his life. Very similar thing apparently will occur here toward the end of the tribulation. Now, just before the seventh and final bowl, which is the fiercest, the most terrible of all, what would you expect? God, in his amazing grace, at the darkest hour of the tribulation, allows his son Jesus to speak. Jesus himself speaks a word of challenge and warning to his people who are scattered across the earth. Let's look at that, verse 15. Look, I am coming like a thief, Jesus says, the one who is alert and remains clothed spiritually so that he may not go around naked and people see his shame. He or she is blessed. This is the fourth of seven beatitudes, seven blesseds in the book of Revelation. When we come to the last one, I'll put them all into a chart for you. Now, those who believe that the rapture of the church will take place at the end of the tribulation, called a post-trib rapture, they would say this verse is talking about the rapture. However, I and many other Christians believe that this warning here is not about the rapture, which took place, I think, seven years before this. This is talking about the second coming. Jesus is referring to his own coming to earth when he will rescue his people physically from the armies of the beast. So it, what may happen here is that just as God protected his uh, people Israel in the land of Egypt, remember when they were in Goshen during those Egyptian plagues, God protected Israel again and again from the Egyptian plagues, so God may protect his people, believing Jews and Gentiles during the tribulation from the results of these terrible bowl judgments. We're not sure. So the destination of these armies of the kings of the east and other world rulers is one of the most famous Bible words that even unbelievers who've never read the Bible know this word, and you'll see it here in verse 16. So they assembled them at the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. So even someone who doesn't read the Bible knows that word. And believe me, a lot of ink has been written, printed, and now cyberspace taken up with all this discussion of Armageddon, what has been called the Battle of Armageddon, which probably more accurately should be described as the campaign or the war 
of Armageddon. This area is about 50 miles north of Jerusalem, the Valley of Jezreel, near the ancient city of Megiddo, and this is the ancient city of Megiddo here in the foreground. The valley where this great battle and war will take place is in the background. The valley is about 14 miles wide, 20 miles long. It's been the site of many battles in history, including uh, the likes of Napoleon and others. And it may be the staging area where the troops are assembled before they attack Jerusalem. And I'll show you a couple of maps in a minute. They will assemble apparently first under Antichrist to destroy Jerusalem and Israel. But the moment Jesus starts returning, they will start fighting against him to keep him from taking over the earth. And we'll look at that in much more detail in chapter 19 in a couple of weeks. Now, let's look at a couple of maps. Oh, by the way, let's go back. This is a beautiful valley. Go back one more, Patrick. This is a gorgeous battle. This is the breadbasket of Israel. I mean, much of the crops that are grown for that country are there. Go forward. You see these beautiful trees. Uh, Israel has instigated a uh, program of forestation, of planting trees of different types. So they're at the forefront of many of these industries. Go forward. Now, looking from the Mediterranean, look forward. Here is Megiddo. Here is Jerusalem. So if you look at the topography of Israel, there's really only four places in Israel that you could uh, easily move troops around. One is the Mediterranean coast. That's very flat. Another is the Jordan Valley. This is very flat, the Jordan flowing down to the, Gord the Dead Sea. Down here is a lot of desert, so that's pretty flat. But here is this valley the Jezreel Valley, where Armageddon, we believe, will take place. So you see, it is the perfect place militarily for troops to be brought. One more picture, one more uh, diagram. This is actually um, a different perspective, again, from the Mediterranean Sea. But again, notice here's this Jezreel Valley, the flat Jordan Valley, the flat coast. So you see, again, if you're going to bring millions of troops to Israel, this is the perfect location to gather them, and then everybody will march north, or rather march south, to invade and attack Jerusalem. Now we look at the blast bowl judgment. This is the most severe of all. Verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice, notice in this paragraph all the uses of megas in Greek, a loud voice came out of the sanctuary from the throne saying, It is done! There were flashes of lightning and rumblings of thunder. And a severe earthquake occurred like no other since man has been on the earth. So great was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. Every island fled and the mountains disappeared. Enormous hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell from the sky on people, and they blasphemed God for the plague of hail because that plague was extremely severe. Brothers and sisters, God is the judge of all the earth. And now God calls the world before his judgment bench. There will be no place to hide, nowhere to run. The worldwide judgments pictured here will finally break the thousands of year rule of sinful man on this earth, which culminates in the rule of the beast for those seven short years. This will be the worst earthquake in history. It will destroy every city in the world, topple every mountain, shake every island loose. We can only guess at the avalanches, the tsunamis that result from this worldwide quake. In verse 19, the city that falls is probably Jerusalem here, and Babylon the Great, which is mentioned also here, we will spend the next couple of weeks looking at in Revelation 17 and 18 with much more detail about that city and system and symbol. One uh, piece of um, insight that I got from this uh, that I don't know that I've heard anybody else uh, bring up before. In the book of Leviticus, what was the punishment for idolaters and blasphemers? In Israel, idolaters, people who worshipped idols, and blasphemers of God, they were to be stoned to death. Now God himself executes 
these people who worship the image of the beast and idol and who blaspheme God. God himself stones them to death with hundred pound hailstones. As someone might say at this point, don't mess with God. A great comment about this last paragraph is, men who would not have the saviors, it is finished on Calvary. So they must have the awful, it is done from the judge. You know, I know this has been a hard, hard chapter to look at. And I've shared with you so often here the stories of triumphs and victories of saints from yesteryear. Yet the truth is that many dear believers down through the centuries have been plagued by doubts and fears about their salvation. One such man was named Dr. Samuel Johnson. He was perhaps the greatest man of letters in English history, and his most famous work was the Dictionary of the English Language, which was really the first dictionary in English that modernized the language that you and I speak today. It's one of the greatest achievements of scholarship of all time. Imagine the literary colossus you would have to be to write a dictionary. And yet, Samuel Johnson did it in nine years. Johnson was dedicated and devout, but his religion was a joyless duty. He took Christianity too seriously for his own good. It became a burden, not a comfort. Most of all, Johnson feared dying and going to hell. Through most of his life, Johnson never grasped what it means to be a Christian. He kept thinking, oh, Christianity is something that I've got to carry. And he couldn't see that True Christianity is someone who carries us by His grace and power. But somehow, and by the way, many people think that only stupid people become Christians, which is wrong. Some of the most brilliant people who've ever walked this planet were Christians. And something else, people often have this mistaken idea that if you have doubts and fears and questions, it's because you're stupid. No, Johnson was one of the most brilliant men who ever lived. And yet he had these questions and he doubts. So it's not about your IQ to have these questions. But somehow, somewhere along the way, God's light dawned on his soul. When he was 75 years old and he lay dying, he felt calm at last. He witnessed to his doctor. He witnessed to his manservant. And I want to show you his final prayer as Johnson partook of communion before his death, and here it is. Almighty and merciful Father, sounds like our brother Fred, I am now, as to human eyes it seems, about to commemorate for the last time the death of my Redeemer. Grant, O Lord, that my whole hope and confidence be in His merits and Thy mercy. Accept my imperfect repentance and the, make the death of Thy Son effectual for my redemption. Pardon the multitude of my offenses. Support me in the hour of death and receive me to everlasting happiness for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we have studied some fearful, fearful judgments coming one day on this world. But we Christians do not have to fear God's wrath. And it's not just because I think the rapture will take place seven years before those bold judgments. Much more, we don't have to fear God's wrath because Jesus Christ, our Savior, bore God's wrath in our place on the cross. We don't have to dread the tribulation. We don't have to dread death or hell because Jesus bore God's wrath in our place. Amen. We don't have to doubt. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear. Jesus paid it all. Let's pray. Father, this is your word, and we accept it at face value, and I pray that the lessons of this very, very tough chapter will go with us this week. I pray, Father, whatever your spirit would say to each of us, uh, that we would uh, take it very much to heart. And so, Lord, uh, thank you for this church that we love and for the fellowship that we have here. Most of all, we thank you that we belong to you. And that we don't have to fear or dread these things because Jesus paid it all. We ask this in his name. Amen. God bless you.